can you hear me? Great. Listen, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. When Rachna told me about this session, I was excited about uh, being with uh, all of you. We've got uh, really great companies represented here with, uh, the, I would say, the, the best communicators probably in the industry. Uh, so I'm sure my communication skills are going to be on, on challenge here this morning. And really, I think the challenge for us as, uh, I would say, private enterprise, governments, uh, venture capitalists, entrepreneurs is really how do you think and act differently in the world that we live in to harness really the power of innovation to propel companies forward and countries forward. I think that's really the, the challenge at hand uh, in, in the world we live in. I thought I'd give you really just a quick backdrop on uh, GE and set the context of uh, what we do in terms of innovation at GE. Uh, and hopefully it'll be helpful. I'm sure that all of you have uh, a lot of innovation happening in your company, both in terms of innovation for customers, uh, but really how to use communication, different models of communication help with that. Uh, but I think it's always good to crowdsource, share ideas, and, and really incorporate you know, other thoughts from other companies. And that's really what we do. And I think that's a, a big model of what I'm going to talk about in terms of innovation. And I do seriously believe say the bedrock of uh, the innovation in, the, in this century. Uh, because I think it's, it's not just about uh, us in silos in innovating, it's really how do you leverage the broad ecosystem. So just a quick history, uh, you know, GE is a 126-year-old company. It was founded by Thomas Edison. Uh, and in fact, he was the start of really the second industrial revolution with the invention of the, of the light bulb. There have been many innovations along the course of the history of GE, um, you know, with uh, jet engines, X-ray technology, MRI technology. Really, it's, it's critical for us. You have to be able to innovate to survive 126 years and, uh, and, and beyond. We really operate in three uh, sectors, the power sector, uh, the healthcare sector, uh, and the aviation sector. Those are the core sectors. And then I would say the horizontal pieces that connect GE that are really incredibly important for the future of the company uh, and, and where we're really spending a lot of time innovating is around digital technology. Uh, you see that as one of the kind of the horizontal pillars. Uh, and, and relatively new is additive technology, which we think is going to be massively disruptive in the world of uh, manufacturing and, uh, and services. So that's just kind of a, uh, a look at GE um, as, a, as a company. In terms of GE in South Asia, the way we think about it is really in three ways. You know, what we do to innovate, uh, we've got a large technology presence. We have over 5,000 engineers and scientists, uh, and, and we've been present in this country with a big presence really for the last 17 to 18 years from a technology standpoint. And we leverage this base to innovate for us globally as well as locally. And a lot more emphasis on us leveraging that team to innovate uh, locally. And I'll share some examples of that. Uh, we also have a big investment in manufacturing and supply chain. So that's something that is relatively, I would say, emerging for us and, and gaining a lot of traction. Uh, we have a, a huge supplier base, as you can see from this. And then finally, commercially, you know, we, we've been very successful here, I would say, over the last, you know, four to five years. We've doubled our business, uh, and you can see the impact on the, on the right-hand side in terms of the presence we have here from an install base standpoint. In terms of power generation, you know, we touch 300 million people uh, every year in terms of healthcare technology. Uh, we have 60% of our technology in transmission and distribution of electricity, et cetera. So big footprint. So just a quick backdrop. So I just want to switch to innovation and spend some time on, uh, on innovation. Uh, we run a, a survey every two years. It's called the Innovation Barometer. And we run this across uh, 20 countries around the world. Um, and we really tap into the top business executives in, in these countries in terms of how they're thinking about innovation. You know, what are some of the topics you know, that are, I would say, top of mind? As you can see here, these are the, you know, the key findings for India. And I, I, you know, just a few takeaways. One is I think the environment uh, in, in terms of innovation is more conducive, right? That's kind of the general uh, feedback from the business executives. So they feel more bullish about uh, innovation in India. There's been a lot of uh, movement and traction. Uh, multinationals, you know, together with uh, a lot of the local startups are seen as driving innovation. So it's not just uh, you know, one set of companies. Um, and then you can see some of the kind of technologies that we pulse them on, you know, digital, additive, you know, smart cities. Uh, all these technologies they deem as uh, really gaining traction uh, and, and, and really being important for the future of innovation uh, in the country. So what I want to do is just 
spend a few minutes talking about, I would say, the principles of innovation at GE. And I, I think these principles um, are, are probably broad principles, hopefully, that are helpful for all of you. And I think when I talk about principles of innovation, I think they apply not just to innovation for customers or products or services, but really innovation in general. Uh, because I think innovation, number one, uh, I think on this page what I would tell you is the most important change in innovation that's happened uh, and probably in every company is that you know, innovation is not just about innovating uh, within the company. It, it's just, if you're innovating just within the company, you're gonna be left behind, right? And that's a clear realization that has you know, come about. You know, certainly we've transformed the company in terms of how we think about innovation. Uh, and it has to be the broadest ecosystem uh, that we can leverage to innovate because you know, we don't have all the good ideas anymore. Right? It, it just doesn't happen that way. That's not the world we live in. Uh, with all the technologies that are emerging, moving so quickly, it's impossible for any company to keep up with uh, innovation in a silo. And so I think that's the first broad message. And I think it's very applicable to the communication world in terms of how you think about innovation. Uh, you can't just innovate within, uh, within the company. So when we think about innovation, we really take a very broad view of the ecosystem. It's other companies, it's partners, it's government, uh, it's, uh, it's really think tanks, uh, it's universities. Um, and we have different models, and this is where, I, again, I think that communication plays a very important role and how we can connect with all of these stakeholders and leverage these stakeholders to really foster innovation uh, in, a, in a broad ecosystem. That's incredibly, incredibly important for the company. You can see some of the examples that I've taken here. I mean, these are just words for all of you. Uh, but, you know, CamTech is a, a collaboration of, um, of medical companies that's looking at really primary health care. Uh, so we, we have a broad network. We have a global insight network that we leverage, which are the top kind of, I would say, innovators that we uh, uh, really convene in different countries to think about, you know, what are the trends in innovation. Uh, so there's a multitude of different things that we do, uh, you know, innovation challenges with universities, et cetera. So these are just some local examples of what we do within India. Uh, we do this globally in many countries. Uh, so we're very active in terms of leveraging the ecosystem. So I would say that's kind of the first, really the first message that I would give to all of you uh, to think about in, in terms of innovation. You know, second, I would say, uh, and you know, probably I would say the most important, as important as leveraging the ecosystem, is really transforming the culture of the company. Uh, you know, when you're a startup, you're basically kind of, I would say, born in a way, you're, you're raising that company to innovate, right? But the companies that have been around, which many of you, you know, there's many multinationals in this room that have been around for decades. And, and so we're very mature companies, we're in mature businesses, uh, you know, we're successful. Uh, but how do you break out of the kind of the core of what we've been doing and how do we innovate? And it's all about culture. Uh, it's, it's really driving a culture change within the company to think about, you know, not a not invented here syndrome. You know, how, is it okay to fail? Uh, when you think of startups, there's a very small percentage of startups that actually succeed. Uh, but those startups may fail, but they learn, right? And those startups can go on to, uh, or I, I would say the entrepreneurs can go on to launch other startups that are successful. So I think one of the main principles of innovation that we felt was important was, was this culture transformation within the company. So we launched uh, what we call FastWorks within the company. And I would say the principles, again, are, are broadly applicable to, to any company and how we think about it, right? It really starts with kind of you know, customer need, uh, what are the assumptions that go into what's gonna fulfill the customer needs? And then this very important concept of what we call MVP, which is uh, minimally viable products. Uh, in terms of getting out there, testing your hypothesis uh, with the customers, we used to, you know, we're used to as a company, and many of you here, uh, in terms of launching products that are designed uh, to perfection and, and only then they can go out in the marketplace, right? This concept of testing a hypothesis, getting feedback, uh, really I would say uh, learning from your mistakes, failing is okay. Uh, so this concept of pivot or persevere 
was probably the biggest cultural transformation that we had to go through in the company. We're, we're still on that journey. I wouldn't say by any means that we're through that and that everyone feels comfortable because we've been taught that execution and flawless execution is kind of the culture of the company. And so when you tell someone that, look, we're gonna go experiment and we're gonna fail, um, you know, that's hard uh, within the company. You know, that's kind of born and raised you know, for 100, 100 plus years uh, to say, yeah, fine, I'll, I'll raise my hand and said I failed on this experiment. But the most important thing that we're trying to drive is learn from that failure, right? Learn from the failure and then, as I said, you can pivot, which means learn and, and go in another direction. Uh, or you know, the learnings could be that you're, you're on the right track and you persevere and move on. So that's kind of the, the culture transformation that we're on. You know, this started about, I would say, four to five years ago. Uh, we're still on that journey. It's very much a very important kind of part of the fabric. The last point on innovation in terms of how we think about it is really how do you industrialize innovation within the company? Uh, you know, it can't just be, a, I would say, a flavor of the day. Uh, and so we've set up this ecosystem and we can do these outreach efforts and you know, get more crowdsource ideas, et cetera. But how do you actually implement and industrialize innovation? And so there's a framework of how we think about it. Uh, and that framework, I would say, actually starts from right to left if you look at this page, right? It starts with the market. We leverage you know, different mechanisms to really test and pulse the market. I talked about this global um, innovated, uh, innovation network. So we use think tanks, we use you know, uh, people that really think about what are the next trends. Uh, so it starts with that. Uh, we, we look at our existing technologies that we can license to other startups that have ideas on how, get, how they could transform markets. That's a big part of what we do. Uh, so we've got a lot of intellectual property that we can leverage you know, for startups to make them more successful. Um, new business creation. So one of the big things that we're doing uh, in, in terms of innovation is, together with this FastWorks principles, is launching startups within the General Electric company. So we started out, I would say, on the far left, which is you know, how do we invest in other startups, uh, which are kind of close to our space, and how we leverage those startups. But more importantly now, we're also launching startups within the company uh, with that kind of mentality, the FastWorks mentality, uh, seed funding for those startups. Uh, it's not a sense of entitlement that you get X amount of money, which is the way we used to behave and think. Uh, so it's very, very much a, a startup mentality with those uh, startup companies. So uh, you know, what I want to do is just kind of wrap here. I know we want to stay on time here, uh, so I'll... Uh, invite Arun up here, I guess so we can do a Q&A. And you know, this is, I'll, I'll leave this page up here. This is just some local examples of kind of innovations as Arun's walking up here and that I can hit on. We, we innovate uh, really in many ways here in India, doing things around, I would say, environmental as well as social impact uh, around things like rural electrification, electrifying villages, and, and so on, and, and in healthcare, which is a big part of what we do. Thank you very much, Vishal. Right. If I could yeah. ask you to have a seat there. I think that that chair is much better lit. Okay. So you should, well, you I've been lit take, all along, so. You should take <laughs> that one. I, I, can, I can remain in the shadows. So Vishal, I thought your presentation was, was really interesting um, because I suspect for many people in, in this room, it will really resonate the challenge of trying to turn a mature company and a massive company at that uh, into one that encourages a culture of innovation um, and that encourages this idea that um, employees should embrace failure. Uh, and as you mentioned, this is kind of anathema to everything they have been taught right. as employees right. of GE. So I wanted to start there. How important is communication to those efforts? And how do you, on a kind of day-to-day -day grassroots basis, how do you engage employees to create this culture where innovation is encouraged and failure is embraced. Yeah. So that, that's, I would say, Arun, at the core of kind of setting the journey towards innovating in the company, uh, within the company, uh, as opposed to partnering with you know, startups and, mm -hmm. and so on. And communication is, I would say, the, the bedrock of, of creating this culture. So when, when we started with FastWorks, which was really this culture change, uh, it started really at the top, right, at the executive level, 
where we brought in, we actually leveraged outside partner to think about, you know, how you think about startups within a company, within a large company. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a massive amount of communication from there on out over the last five years in terms of training people, communicating. And I would say probably the most important part was uh, highlighting examples, you know, mm -hmm. within, within businesses of what we've actually done and learned from, mm -hmm. you know, failures. So I think the best way you can reinforce this kind of culture is by real examples, right? Mm -hmm. By highlighting the fact, you know, here's a team that did this, you know, they failed, but that's okay. Um, and even setting up rewards for those kinds of things, right? <laughs> to celebrate the fact that, you know, this was actually a good failure, we learned something. <laughs> Um, out of it, and I, I know example that I'm very familiar with where in healthcare we were going to launch something and uh, it was a two-year program and we decided that you know, it was better to do it in the fast words fashion mm -hmm. and you know, we went out and tested the hypothesis with customers and, and they basically said you know, what you're you know, planning on doing is not going to work. Mm -hmm. right? and, and so this team that you know, had everything prepared, they were going to kind of go launch this program you know, came back and said, wow, this is, and, and those are the kinds of things that we talk about within the company. Sure. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I've, I have heard of, of some companies that have failure parties, yeah. for example, which um, sounds like fun. We're not quite there yet. But. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder, for you as a business leader, do you feel you have had to change your style of leadership to try and encourage this culture of innovation? Without, without a doubt. And I would say, you know, all of us as leaders within GE have been going through that transition because, as, as you said, you know, we've kind of grown up in a culture of execution and delivery and accountability. And so it's a really, you know, it's a real transformation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of that has come from the training sessions that we've all attended, uh, you know, talking about listening to outside startups and outside principles and how they think about startups and... Um, so I think it's a, it's a real journey. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like you know, we make the transition you know, just through one training session. It's really continuous reinforcement. Sure. So yes, with, without a doubt, we're, we, we have to change. So you, you take a lot of steps over a number of years to develop and de deploy this kind of culture of, of innovation across the company. And, and you mentioned the steps that you've taken. How do you measure its success? Does return on innovation exist? You know, I would say we, um, we measure it uh, in a somewhat similar way mm -hmm. in terms of how we think about investments that we make for products and services. Uh, but there's a couple of other elements that I think come into innovation. We're also looking now more so at the environmental impact and the social impact mm -hmm. that we would have. You know, so it's not all about, obviously you gotta have a profitable business model. You know, without a doubt. But when we're innovating, the visibility on return initially is not as clear. Mm -hmm. you know, when we're in mature businesses, we, we know the markets, we know what product investment is gonna cost, we know how many we're gonna sell. You know, so the you know, example I had up there on rural electrification and electrifying villages, we really don't know what the return is gonna look like. Mm. Uh, initially. So I think it's a little bit of a different flavor. Uh, we know it has a tremendous social impact, mm. right? And, and being able to electrify villages in, in India. Mm -hmm. uh, we think, in fact, the hypothesis is that we can scale this and there's a you know, multitude of, in, in terms of technology opportunity that we can make money. But um, I, I think it's a slightly, it's a mix of those elements, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Now, one of the things you, you mentioned um, in your innovation barometer is that there has been a significant increase in the perception of India mm -hmm. um, as a market and as an environment that is conducive to innovation. Um, to what do you attribute that change in perception? I think the initiatives like Digital India, Startup India, uh, I think all of those things are factors in enabling innovation. I, I think the uh, innovation hubs that are being set up uh, in different states, I think those are all positive movements. So I think clearly the country is making 
uh, a change. Mm -hmm. And you know, this has become, India has become the third largest startup ecosystem in the world. Now I think where we have to get to is not just the volume part, right? We've got to translate that volume of startups into real success. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's, I think, going to be the key. Uh, mm -hmm. And success is you know, going to be based on, obviously, a lot of talent. Uh, it's also a lot about culture. Uh, you know, Indian culture is not, it's not okay to fail, right, within the Indian culture. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of a different context, right, in terms of family context and so on. Uh, so I think there's a lot of things that we need to do to uh, you know, still make a movement in terms of using the infrastructure and creating this or, or translating this volume of startup you know, community that we have into real innovation mm -hmm. right, that can make a difference in the country and globally because I think you know, India should be thinking about what we can do here to innovate globally as well. Mm. So presumably there's quite a big educational component. I think education well. is, is absolutely key. Because I think uh, early education in terms of how we're trained. I mean, I, you know, I grew up in India a while back. Uh, I went to IIT Delhi. Uh, and uh, you know, I would say the education environment there was very regimented. Uh, and I went uh, from IIT Delhi to a grad school in the US. And I could see a marked difference mm. in terms of just how they think about education. It's, it's much more, I, I, I would say it was a lot broader. Mm. Now, those, that was a long time ago, right? Mm. So things have changed, and I think you know, we need to continue to drive that, uh, drive that change in the education system. Okay. Um, and then another thing that the report pointed to, um, there were some insights about how innovation will impact the future of work, yeah. which, of course, is you know, it's, it's on the continuum, of course, and, and, of course, on the continuum with, educa with education. Right. How do you see these kind of advances in, in innovation impacting the work environment, especially with regard to the skills that are needed and maybe how that's changing? Yeah. No, that's, that's a huge topic, mm. as, 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 as you can imagine, the uh, future of work and uh, what's going to happen. I think there's really two uh, opposing kind of thoughts to it, right? One, one thought is that the future of work is going to, or, or uh, innovation is going to impact jobs in, in a negative way mm. you know, because of all the productivity that we're driving. Uh, so that's kind of one, one camp. Um, and I think the other camp is clearly that if you look back over many, many years of cycles of innovation, because we're in the fourth industrial revolution, uh, we've seen a constant increase in terms of employment. Um, and I think that is driven by the fact that there's a whole new set of skills uh, that are needed in this new world. Right, of artificial intelligence and 3D printing and data science, and analytics, and on and on. And so I think to your point, I think this whole skilling and education of actually getting prepared uh, to have the workforce that can actually gravitate and move towards these new skill sets, right? So there's a whole new set of jobs mm -hmm. that are going to be created. Um, and there's clearly existing jobs that will be impacted. There is no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of the things that we do in terms of driving digital and productivity impacts jobs today. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've got to be prepared as a country and company also, mm -hmm. right, and companies uh, to make that transition effectively. And that in itself is quite a big communications challenge, presumably. It is. It is. And do you feel enough is being done, perhaps? I don't, think, I don't think there is. I, I think more transparency and clarity in terms of what's needed there, because I think there you know, might be a fear factor in terms of what happens here you know, to, to, to work with innovation. And I think that's a, I think that's a big you know, communication, I would say, to do. Mm, OK. So we're pretty much out of time. So for my final question, you have a room of, of some of the country's top communications leaders. What would be your message to them as they are trying to both lead and support a culture of innovation at their companies? Yeah. No, I think that's a, that's a great question. I, my, my advice really would be uh, to be real partners with the businesses, uh, with the business leadership, because I think, as I mentioned, communication, and I would say connecting in a contemporary fashion with the broader ecosystem and how do you leverage communication is really, I would say, at the core and the heart of innovation uh, in, in this century and for the next you know, few decades. Uh, so I think not just, I would say, innovating in the field of communication in, in terms of how you leverage communication, but also really being good partners uh, with, your, with your business leaders, I, I think is really the, 
I see the key message. Okay, and an important message. Well, Vishal, thank you very much. Judging from the uh, feedback on Twitter, you've already demonstrated a very high level of innovation by managing to get a room full of communications leaders to an event at 9.30 a.m. So thank you very much. And <laughs> Thanks, um, Oren. congratulations and well done. I thought it was a, a, a no, fascinating um, presentation. Today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. It was great to be here. Thank you, Vishal. Thank you, Arun. Thank you so much.